easier to hear. Maybe, maybe not, but we'll go from there. Let's open the service in word of prayer. We'll have a bit of a adjusted service tonight. Um, you know what? We can still be together. We can still study God's word. We can still sing praise to God. That'd be okay. Now, you see, if I see anyone walking by, I'll signal someone to go go get them. But I don't know if that will happen or not. You see, anytime we say off, there's probably not going to be a lot of visitors. What happens? Uh, everybody shows up. Uh, but anyway, let's go to the word of prayer. And then uh, Josh is going to come and they try to pick a couple of psalms that we all should know the words to. Uh, so I think we do based on the psalms that they picked. And uh, we will go to the prayer. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day. And Lord, again, we thank you for the privilege to assemble ourselves together. We pray, Lord, that you be in the rain. We Thank you for that. We know it's a blessing if it's fallen in the places that really need it. And we just pray that we do the service this night. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Mm-hmm. Right, the first time it's like this, God is so good. I will just sing the first verse twice. I can need to. Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, 
And Gadeva saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? They enter in the second time into his mother's womb and be born. Jesus answered, Very, very, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof. Canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? He said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Very verily I say unto thee, We speak that we that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I had told you earthly things, ye, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No man hath ascended unto heaven. He that, had, that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, this phrase, born again Christian, we use that all the time. What does it even mean? I mean, we, we talk about that, oh, you have to be born again. And then, then we, we kind of laugh when we read, I don't know about you, but have you ever laughed when you read it It's like, well, can't someone when they're old go back into their mother's womb and be born again? Have you ever talked to an unsaved person who has no Bible background? And they say, what are you trying to tell me? Oh, I'm trying to tell you how to be born again. I guarantee you they have the same reaction that Gideon says. What are you talking about? How can I be born again? Like, wouldn't that mean? If it's not painful enough to give birth to a baby, poor mom wants to give birth to a full grown adult. That's not going to be nice, is it? No, but mom's going to be going, oh, you can go there. Like, uh uh, not happening. Alright, so here we have this. Now, as we begin to look at this passage of scripture, we find Nicodemus. We find a very unusual man in Nicodemus because the Bible is very clear that he was a Pharisee, correct? Now, a religious leader among the people coming to Jesus at night to ask him some questions. Now, right off, I believe there are several items we can learn from this encounter between Jesus and Nicodemus. Alright, so I'm going to give you some lessons we can learn and then we're going to answer the question about the whole being born again thing. Lesson number one, we must learn the importance of taking time to think. And I know that could be a dirty word, and I know that could be a difficult thing. But we have to learn the importance of taking time to think. You know what? If there is something the devil has gotten good at, it is making us so busy that we seldom take the time to think. To really think about important things. I mean, we have families to take care of. That's not a bad thing. And by the way, some of these things that I'm going to tell you that we're so wrapped up and so busy with aren't bad. Right off the bat, we have families to take care of. Is that a bad thing? No, that's a good thing. That's a biblical thing. That's a noble thing to have family to intend to take care of them. We have jobs to work. That's not a bad thing. The Bible says if you don't provide for your own, you're worse than an infidel. Right, so work. The Bible also says if you don't work, you don't eat. That would solve a lot of problems, wouldn't it? <laughs> really would. You're hungry? Good. Go work. Oh, you're not going to work? Guess you're fasting. Simple. Work's the important thing. You got to pay bills. That's not a bad thing. You got chores around the house. If you don't do chores, have you ever lived, not done chores for a few days? It's pretty bad. All right, you got to do chores. That's not a bad thing. Right? And then different times of year, when it comes in Christmas time, then there's family get-togethers and presents to buy and presents to wrap and meals to cook and trees to do. And then you go different times now and, and you know, there's, there's people who are watching television or, you know, on the internet or playing games and, 
and on and on and on and it goes. What is it? Busy, 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 busy. And as long as we can stay busy, we think busyness is productive. Not always. You can be so busy, you really do nothing. Or we think, in some Christian circles, they think busyness equals spirituality. You can be the most busy person in the world, even doing good godly things, and be carnal. You just learn to do the to do list and the checklist. And so we have this Pharisee who was busy with religion and busy with keeping the law and, and busy with teaching and busy with all these things. And evidently, somewhere along the line, he stopped and paused and began to think. He began to question things. He took time to think about what was really important in life. He was wondering if there was eternal life. And if so, how do you find it? Now, I think Jesus' answer is kind of like, aren't you supposed to be a master in Israel? I, I mean, hey, aren't you a teacher of these things? Of anyone should know, you should know what I'm talking about, right? You're the religious teacher. And so we, we see this, and he took time to think. Now, let me ask you this. When was the last time you took time to think? When was the last time you thought about what was really important? What was the last time you spent time thinking about what am I investing my life in? What was the last time you sat down and wondered if you'd be pleased when you got to the end of your life with how you chose to spend it? You know, when, you, when, you're, when you're there at the end of the life and you're, you're facing death, and you were to look back on your life as it is now, would you be pleased to meet God with the life you're living? Or would you think, oh, no, no, I'm not going to regret some things. Now, if we're all honest, we should regret some things, right? <laughs> well, we'd rather we made certain choices better than other choices. Nicodemus teaches us a bit about the importance of taking time to think. Just think about these things and, and, and to ponder them and to, to look for answers. Second thing he teaches us is this. And we'll say it in a minute to explain it. We must be careful in the way we judge people. We must be careful in the way we judge people. Most of what we hear, most of what we think about Pharisees is usually negative, correct? I mean, did Jesus have a lot of good things to say about them? Didn't he call them like whited sepulchers, full of dead man bones? There's, there's a compliment. You want to beat someone? Here's a whited sepulcher full of dead man's bones. Now, that's what makes some friends with those people, isn't it? 101 ways to win friends. There you go. Number one. Oh, I'm a whited sepulcher full of dead man's bones. Probably not. They were a strict religious sect, and most of them lived their lives very strictly, trying to make sure they didn't break any of God's laws. They were very legalistic, and many of them were teachers. Now, most of the time when you saw a Pharisee, the first thought in your mind was, there was someone who really wanted to know who Jesus was. No, right? Oh, there's a religious person. Even Jesus said, but aren't you a master and knowest all these things? The me. Even hey, Jesus, shouldn't you know these things? So wasn't Jesus making some assumptions about him? Be careful you judge people. Sometimes the people you look at and you make a snap judgment of, oh, they won't, they're not really thinking about God. You'd be shocked. Really? I've seen a number of people, you know, walk into a church and full of tattoos and all these piercings and all that type of stuff, and, and people are like, oh, why are they in church? Maybe they're the ones actually thinking. Maybe they're the ones who are actually, you know, looking for the question, answering the question we're about to talk about. Then again, some people look at some people, oh, well, 
that person must be spiritual because you know what? When they come to church and they have a Bible and they, they dress like they're going to church and they look like they're going to church and, and all their family looks like, you know, it's all in line and, and everyone looks to roll and everyone does the part and everyone serves this, does that. I mean, oh, there's a spiritual person. Be careful how you judge people. You don't know. I've met some people that look the part of Mr. Spiritual, but yet the guy that's full of tattoos and piercings and all that is actually more spiritual than that one. You say, why? Well, let's be honest. Some of those full of tattoos and piercings, you can't exactly just erase them. Can you? I mean, it's not easy. I mean, I guess you can do some things, but you kind of usually can't completely get rid of things. You bear the marks of each one of those And if most people were to look at Nicodemus, most people would go, oh, Pharisee, he really doesn't care about the things of God. He's just a religious legal nut. And they would just write him off. But who was it that was coming to Jesus that really, really wanted to know? Master, he knew some things. Master, thou art a king except for God. Right? It's, I don't have eternal life. Like, this is troubling me. This is bothering me. Most of the people in his day, most of the disciples of his day, would have looked at a Pharisee and gone, don't waste your time. Be careful. Be careful how you judge people. I learned that a lot of times in um, just dealing with my father, dealing with when I, when I was at University one year before I got married, um, I shared my testimony, and someone came up to me and said, "You need to be in the prison ministry." And I thought, "Okay, I'll be in the prison ministry." And I went into the prisons, and uh, they 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 heard my testimony like, "Oh, we've got the perfect pot for you where we're going to stick you." And I was like, "Oh boy, where are you going to stick me?" They're like, "Maximum security." Wonderful. This is great. And I'll never forget going in there and you look at those guys and, and you, have you ever looked at a crowd and judged it right away? <laughs> These guys are rough. I mean, some of the guys, they came to church because it was the only time they could get out of their pot and they could get in there. And they, they, they were rough with them. And I'll never forget one day I was all by myself. I was the only one who showed up in, in my group. And literally, the way it was, it was set up a bit like this room. And say that was a door in the back, and then that was a door over there in the side. And uh, you would come in, and before you came in, you would have to be searched, and uh, you'd have to make sure you didn't have any paper clips, and you have to make sure you didn't have any staples. If you brought handouts to give the the men, they couldn't have any staples or paper clips in them. You don't believe me? You don't want? You want to know why? You should watch a video of what kind of weapons they can make with staples and paper clips in prison. And you say, how do you know that? They made you watch that video before you were approved to go into prison. It's shocking, but not surprising. I knew my father. Um, and so none of that surprised me. And these were big guys, rough guys, in there for murder, in there for all kinds of things. And uh, one day, we, when I was all by myself, I came in there. And the way they do it is you, you, they open this door, and you walk into this hallway. And then they shut the door so it's sealed. Then they open that door, and they let you into the room where church service is going to be. And then when you get into the room, and you're at the front of the room where the podium is, you stand in the center of the room, and you wave. And when you wave, the security guy sees that you wave, that door closes, and you hear clink, 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 clink. And at that moment, you know you're locked in. You cannot just open the door and get out. And then you hear it, ping, 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 and that door over there on the side opens. And when it opens, it opens straight out into the cell block where all the prisoners are in the big open court. And then one by one, they begin to file in and fill the seats. And fill the seats. Mind you, I'm, remember, I'm standing here. They're filling the seats where you are. And then, um, you know, I, I was sitting and go, is that everybody? If no one else came, I would wave my hand again. That door would close, and you would hear the noises again, and that would lock. 
And at this particular day, it was me and about 40 maximum security prisoners were all locked together in this room. The only way out was through them and through that locked door, and they were not unlocking it as long as those 40 guys were there. It was not happening. And I'll never forget that day in the back, there was a new guy, and I thought, oh, he's going to be in trouble. They were looking at someone and thinking, oh, there's going to be trouble. I was wrong. It was Muslim. He came there to pick some things. He, I didn't realize it, but he brought about five guys with him in the middle of the service. And they began to pick some things and pick some fights. And literally, an all out quarrel broke out in the church. I mean, literally. And I'm sitting there, and if that happens, you're supposed to wait. Now think about this. 40 guys, big guys, all where you're sitting between me and that window, I can wave all I want. They ain't seeing me. <laughs> it ain't happening. You say, what did you do? I didn't know what to do. I just prayed. And next thing you know, the entire front row of men stood up formed a wall around me and dared them to go through them to get to me. And then this entire wall begins going <laughs> like this. And next thing you know, this door opens and in rushes like these officers. And they break up the fight and they grab the guys and they throw them back into their cells and lock them up, you know. And then they, they shut the door, and then they didn't lock the door, they didn't shut the door. And then they came back in and said, uh, everything else is okay in here? I said, it's okay. And they said, uh, would you like to continue with church? I said, the fellas, you want to continue with church? Said, Literally, here's what they said, I don't know where else to go. <laughs> I said, okay. You got nowhere else to go. So they all sat back down and we had church. He said, after a ball, after a ball. You know what? That day, at least three men took the process. You look at people and you think one thing. It's a different people. You know what I knew? I knew, I mean, I knew that God would be in control and God would take care of it. But here's what I learned that day. I looked at these guys and I thought, I wonder what would happen. In the back of your mind, when you get locked in there with Maxwell Street prison, you think, I wonder what would happen when they get mad and roll for You know what I knew? The first verse they would protect you of the I was shocked. I really was. Um, you judge a crowd. Well, a little while later, I was I was uh, at a local grocery store and I had stopped on the way home from work. And this was after I got married. And uh, I was at the florist section. And I was looking through flowers to pick up and bring home to my wife. And there was only one nice bunch of flowers left. And all of a sudden, uh, I had it in my hand. Do you ever feel like someone's behind you? Well, I felt like someone's behind me. And then I felt the hand on my back. A really big, strong hand grip my back. My shoulder. And I just went, yes. And I heard a voice. You say why? I knew the voice, and I knew where I knew the voice from. He just got out of maximum security prison. <laughs> and he says to me, Fisher. I said, Yes, and I said his name. I didn't turn around and look at him. I knew who he was. I called him my name. He goes, How do you know me? And I said, I don't forget you much. And he came around and I wondered what you're gonna do. Now, mind you, he already had his hand on my back, my wallet was in my back pocket, he had whatever he wanted. He comes up and puts around and goes, I've been kind of dumb, and the missus is mad. Can you pick me up some good flowers to bring home to her? And I said, sure. See, what do you do? All the other flowers, they were horrible, so I took the bunch I had in hand and I said, that would be good. She'll be happy with those. He goes, what were you doing with those? I said, I was just proud of That's okay, you can have them. We talked to him, and, and I nice chat with him, and I invited him and his wife, and I said, bring your wife to church. Well, sure enough, they came to church a few times. It was really interesting. What, what are you saying? Don't judge people based on how you see them. 
see that from this passage of scripture. The third thing, real quick, before we answer this question. Nicodemus thought. He didn't care what people thought of him. He didn't care how people would judge him. He went to the right source. He wanted to know about eternal life for Jesus. Go ahead. You know what? When he had an issue, he went to the place where he could get the right answer. He took his questions and served Jesus. You know what I'm thankful for John chapter 3? I'm thankful that the internet didn't exist, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, or any other social media. You say, why? Too many people go to all those things and get all messed up. Go to the right source. Go to Jesus. Go to the Bible. Get trained for the Bible. And I know this sounds funny because someone's going to be watching the service on YouTube because they're just recording uh, for people who are all around who do attend the church service in that way. I'm going to tell you this. I've been too many people when they start questioning things, rather than opening up the Bible, they go find something on YouTube or something on the internet, and it completely messes them up. I mean, time and time and time and time again, I could give you a list of at least 15 to 20 people who should be in church right here, right now, tonight. But the reason they are not is they got on YouTube and they got on Facebook and they got on some internet social media and they began to study up the all this weird wacky stuff because you can make anything sound good and it can bring you less time. As we look at this, we learn these items, we learn the importance of taking time, we learn to be careful about judgment, we learn to go to the right source for question now. He said, what must I do to be saved? Go to verse 3. Jesus answered and said, Very, very, I say unto thee, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, he must be born again. That's why we call ourselves born again Christians. Now, uh, there is no other kind of Christian. There really isn't. You're born again or you're not. There, there's no other kind of Christian. A saving place, and I will get Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. Verse 25. As in at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praise unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison were shaken. Immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing the prisoners that has been fled. The whole cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we all are for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And spake unto him the words of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And when he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God and all his house. When it was day, the magistrate sent the sergeant, saying, Let those men go. What does this pastor say he must do to have eternal life? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. What else? Just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. To put all your faith and all your hope in Him. Seems pretty simple, right? Now, we're going to walk through something a little bit more, but please don't go at me. Just let us walk through with you, okay? And we'll get to the end, you'll see we're probably we're coming the same way. Now, think about here Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. So, you know, okay, get in the right question, you got to read the Lord Jesus Christ. Yep, Matthew 16, verse 24. Matthew 
Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take the cross and follow me. Now we understand there's a difference between following the Christ in this way and salvation, right? I mean, we the Lord's trying to be saved, but truly, if you are saved, you should take it seriously. Right? So, what did Jesus tell us to do in this verse? Well, he says, deny yourself, take up our cross, and to follow him. As a matter of fact, he says basically the same thing in Matthew 10, 38, Matthew 8, and Mark 8, 34, Luke 9, 23, and Luke 14, 27. Repeatedly, he says that. Right? Now turn with me in Matthew chapter 19. Let's go a couple of chapters up, Matthew chapter 19. And let's look at verse 16 to verse 21. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Do you understand? Multiple people ask Jesus about eternal life. And his answers are a bit different with every person. We see consistently that one, he said, take it across and not follow me. But he's a little bit different. Now, here's where we got to understand. Jesus knows the heart issues we don't. So pray on with me and and uh, Matthew 19, verse, we're going to verse 17, he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Say it unto him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not build false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, wait a minute. You notice there's... there's Major commandment, he did not repeat there. <laughs> Anyone ever notice when Jesus quotes the Ten Commandments, he never quotes Rupert and Sabbath day to keep it holy? Did he quote that? No, he didn't. Right? That's his reason for that. The young man said unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack what lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, and him, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. So, what did Jesus tell this guy he had to do to have eternal life? Well, it seems a bit different, doesn't it? He tells him to sell all you have and follow him. Right. You know, the place in John where Jesus tells Nicodemus he must be born again is really only recorded one time, right? Yes. This event, where Jesus tells his rich young ruler to sell all that he has and to follow him, it's recorded in Mark 19, I mean Matthew 19, Mark 10, and Luke 18. Then, in, uh, take your Bible and look at uh, Luke chapter 12 and verse, 20, and verse 33. Yes. Luke 12, verse 33 says, sell that ye have, and give alms, provide yourself back to the wax, that which wax not old, a treasure in heaven that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, we refer to ourselves, and when we look at this, and we, we refer to ourselves as born-again Christians, why is it that we don't refer to ourselves as self-denying Christians? Why don't we refer to ourselves as cross-carrying Christians? Why don't we refer to ourselves as possession-selling Christians? Could it be that those things are too difficult? We don't really want to give them up? And if we claim to be those things that people could measure the accuracy of our claims by our actions. Hey, if you claim to be a self-denying Christian, I can measure that by how much you deny yourself and how much you put others first, yes or no? If you claim to be a cross-bearing Christian, I can kind of gather how much you bear your cross, yes or no? Be well, I'm going to be a sell everything and help people out kind of Christian. Well, I can come to your house and see how much you really sold, right? These disciples told people different things in different places. Why would they do that? Is it because what people had in their lives that they considered more important than God? Or is it things in their lives that they were counting on for salvation? 
go back and look at John chapter 3. We said to hold your finger there. And I'll speak to you in a moment that really he answered everyone the same way. Number 3, it says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Uh, he's not the only one. In Matthew 3, we read about, you know, in John the Baptist states, the Pharisees came to him and, and asked him some questions. All right, so we, we, we see that as well. Well, think about it. These guys, and he said, sell all and follow me. What were they relying on? They were relying on their family. They were relying on their heritage. Hey, when Nicodemus came to him by night, he says, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, right? That was prestigious. That was his heritage. That was He was relying on the fact that he was a Jew. And as a Pharisee, he was relying on the fact that he was a keeper of the law. And he's relying on all these things. Well, what was Jesus' point? He must have first place in the life. He will not settle for being something you do on the weekend or, some, or something you do on Sunday morning. He says, deny yourself, take your cross, and follow the Lord. What it was must they want to do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and not shall be saved. But I'll tell you this, if you really believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and not shall be saved, you should follow the Lord. He, in all things, he should have the dream. So why did he say to the rich young ruler, so all you have and follow me? Because he knew what he was trusting in. Why did he say to this, this person who was a Jew of the Jews, that was born in a ruler of the Jews, that he had to be born again? Well, as a Jew, you trust in your heritage. You trust in your birth. You know what he's saying? What well, you're trusting in in your first birth doesn't matter. You need a second. The, 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 the ones who had all these different things and all the times that Jesus told them. He was telling them all the same thing. Whatever you're relying in doesn't work. You must come from me and only from me. As we know that God wants you to have know Him and have eternal life. We, we know that sin is a problem and it separates us from God. We know that God's remedy for sin is Christ dying on the cross and, and His death and buried resurrection. And we know that there, your response needs to be to personally accept and trust Christ as your personal Savior. So, going back to Jesus' discussion with Nicodemus. You must be born again. Good people need a new birth. Religious people need a new birth. Church going people need a new birth. They really do. We must be born in the Spirit. How do we do that? We have to do it like Nicodemus did. Hey, Nicodemus admitted he had a need. That's what we have to do. He had to come to Jesus personally. And we have to do it. And he had to place his trust in Christ. In Christ alone. And guess what? That's what you have to do. That's what I have to do. So how do we know that Nicodemus really did get saved and really did put his faith and trust in Christ and was really born again? Who, can I ask you something? Who was the one who after Jesus' death went and there's two people that went after Jesus' body to bury him? Who were they? Joseph of Arimathea, and who was the second one? Nicodemus. Hey, you know what? He got to the point where he said, you know what? I am going to deny myself, take up my cross, and I will follow you. In fact, can you imagine a Pharisee going to the ruler and saying, can I have Jesus' body so I can go to He was identifying himself with Christ. Did you want a death nail in your career as a Pharisee? There it was. There it was. But it all started all the way back when he went and sat down with Jesus and came to him personally. After spending time thinking, after not judging people, and after going to the right source, and go ahead for life. 
and all throughout the mind of people can just I don't have a trouble with that. And the same thing in different ways was said to others. You cannot trust in your way. You must have eternal life come to God through me. And it's the same Father, we come before you. And Lord, we thank you so much for the challenge from the life of Nicodemus, and I pray that as we look at this, may we learn some lessons from it, Lord. May we not judge people based on what we may see or think about them, Lord, but Lord, may we point people to you. Lord, I know it's one thing to, to be born again Christian, but Lord, may we also be uh, self-denying Christians, and may we also be Christians who uh, take up our crosses and follow you, and and live for you each and every day. Or maybe as Nicodemus did, have a change in our lives. And maybe we take stands for you and we, we identify with you very clearly no matter what it may cost. Or when we follow you with all we have across the new Well, thank you for coming out this evening and finding me help in any way. Let me know. Um, I think a lot of the next door is already packed up. So all I think that we need to do is there are photos of this room, so we got to put this room back together again. And we'll pack up in here, and we'll be ready to go. So we look forward to seeing you Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. If you don't know where you and you'd like to, let me know. I'll put you the Zoom link. You can jump on in and join us on a Wednesday night. We pray together. Do continue to be in prayer um, for Sister Rose. Um, from what I was told this morning, when they looked at where they got it, they I don't think they were able to get the entire tumor. Uh, there was part of it back where they couldn't reach. And so I believe Tuesday she has another MRI of some, some type to be able to look and to make sure that they've got enough of it where it's not affecting the nerve and, and all these different things. And then they've got to make decisions of whether they actually physically have to open her up to go in and take the rest out or whether if it's not cancerous and not bothering and affecting her, we they just leave it there and all those type of things that have to be done. So just be in prayer this week as those tests are done and as those decisions are made. Uh, she's doing well now. Just be, be in prayer. Uh, I know talking to her, she was glad that they could do the surgery this way and didn't have to kind of head open. I think we'd all be glad with that one uh, But then they have to go through this and still maybe have to have the other surgery and do be praying for Brother Lomba. Um, he had his biopsy and brain lesion on, I want to say, Thursday. And so this week coming, he should get the results of that. And that will determine whether or not he needs um, surgery on his brain as well. And so they say when it rains, it pours, right? Um, but we know what, let's just be in prayer for our church family. Let's be there, love on them, and do what we can for them. Help them however we can. So, we'll see you one day.